Join us now for today's edition of Mid-South Viewpoint. Quest for the Nail Prince is a story of three ordinary people. We're going to find out about these people today with Don Furr, who joins us on Mid-South Viewpoint. Don is in a studio, and Don, I'm holding the book that just came off the press. And what's exciting for me is you and I met, I'm thinking 12 years ago when I first met you, I came to your office. You told me at that point, you were writing a book. You said, could we do an interview when I get it finished? I said, I'd love to do an interview with you. 14 years later, I'm holding the book in my hand, Quest for the Nail Prince. It's a novel by you, Don Fur. Welcome to Mid-South Viewpoint. Well, thank you, Byron. I appreciate you um, uh, holding true to your word to have the interview with me. That's great. It's been a long process. We're now uh, uh, drawing to the end of this first process, and now we're moving on into the marketing. So uh, Today we want to talk about Quest for the Nail Prince. It's a novel that you wrote. You mentioned this 14 years ago, but is this something that you've always thought that you would like to do? I mean, I know you read The Left Behind, and that kind of you know really pricked your heart and uh, got you thinking about Christ's return. But the concept, the idea behind this book, where was it first planted in your heart? Well, I'm a time travel fan, number one, and that is something that has always intrigued me. Uh, when I started reading Left Behind, I started thinking about uh, the different ins and outs and the process of the story, and I started thinking about that along with the time travel aspect and sort of put the two together. I would always had this thought of being able to meet Jesus and to do so without dying to do so. How could that possibly happen? Well, uh, you know, through the magic of time travel, uh, you know, I was able to put the story together. The story has evolved over 14 years and has come to fruition just in the last year. It's really a good story. I, I enjoy it. I'm getting a lot of fantastic reviews of it, and it, it's just, it's my dream. Why do you think, Don, it's taken you 14 years to see this book come to fruition? Uh, when I started out, I was a uh, typist that typed with two index fingers, and uh, by the time of the end of the process, I'm at least able to use all my fingers. I still have to look at them a little bit. It just took a long time. I, you know, I run the business, Exhibit A, and we are traveling all over the country, all over the world for that matter. So I've had an opportunity to write when I've been out of town and been uh, overseas. I've written the book in places, you know, Paris, London, Romania, been to Jerusalem twice. I remember even one night sitting up in Jerusalem. It was about two o'clock in the morning and I was sitting in my hotel room and I was looking out at the western wall of the outer part of the city at there at the Jaffa Gate. And I was, as I was writing, I was just unbelievable, surreal feeling uh, of writing this story and knowing that Jesus very well could have stood right there. It's almost been mythical to do so. Central theme of the book. Central theme of the book is basically about three people that don't know each other that uh, come together on an airplane. Uh, the book starts out in Memphis. We mentioned the med, we mentioned hospital wing. Uh, a lot of people in Memphis that have started reading the book are mesmerized by the fact that they know these places that I'm talking about. The med actually is even uh, gonna have the book in their gift store there. So the book starts out in the med with a helicopter scene, obviously. Uh, this is my expertise and was able to write the first chapter very easy. But then two other characters come into the book, unbeknownst to them, uh, they all come together on an airplane and they're on their way to Israel, two of them. One of them is actually on his way to New Delhi. Through a strange twist of events, something happens and uh, next thing you know, they're standing on the street in old Jerusalem as Jesus comes in on the donkey on Passion Week. Something else unique about this book is there's actually a hole in the book itself. Well, this is a very beautifully designed book itself, the cover. And as I look through it, there is an actual, what would be an, a nail hole right in the center of the book. Was that your idea? Yes, sir. I had that idea about six months into the project, was thinking about what I wanted to call the story. The, the nails and the nail prints have a very specific part in the book. And then it came across to me, well, why don't we just put a hole all the way through the book? I danced around the fact of trying to read around the hole and if that was going to work or not. Well, it works very well. Uh, it doesn't cause any problems whatsoever. I'm just flipping through. Yeah. You can't, it doesn't no. interfere with any of the words. Obviously laid out very nicely. But yet, Christ's nail prints are on every page of the book. And the idea was that Christ touches every page of our lives in the same way. So that was the idea. 
You know, sometimes, Don, we I think we get away from the fact that it was a very bloody death that Christ paid on that cross when he died. I mean, it was his flesh, as you say in your book, nailed to that tree when he shed his blood and died for us. It wasn't a pretty thing at all, you know, but that's what God did because he loved us so much. He loved us with all the mercy and grace through Jesus. Yeah, amen. I think it's wonderful. Even the drop of blood that comes through the, the nail hole in the book is a great reminder of what Jesus Christ did for us. But something else at the beginning of the book, you quote Albert Einstein. It says, time is not at all what it seems. It does not flow in only one direction, and the future exists simultaneously with the past. You're a fan of Albert Einstein? <laughs> I'm a fan of some of the things that he studied. I'm actually a pretty big fan of Mrs. Einstein. Uh, she had really a great quote. Somebody was asking her if she understood the theory of relativity, talking about her husband and <laughs> Mrs. Ein. You might know the story. Wait, I love it. Yes, and, and Mrs. Einstein said, no, quite frankly, I don't know and understand the theory of relativity. But she said, I know Albert. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it makes me think. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, you know, God knows us. He knows our hearts. And we don't have to know everything. We just have to know Him. Mm. We don't have to know it all. We just have to know the one. That's so true, Don. I appreciate you sharing that. Let me ask you this. When you, you were obviously writing a book, and writing a book is no guarantee that you're going to be able to get a publisher for it. So, I mean, you, is this Sheaf? Sheaf House, Sheaf House Publishers. Publishers is the one. And tell me how you became in a relation with the Sheaf. Well, actually, I finished the book, and I had uh, a lady, uh, Susan Drake, was my editor. I actually got her to edit my first copy of the book, and we all put it together. And I wanted to do, I did a 500-copy printing. Well, we printed the book. I just wanted to see what it would do before I even went to a publisher. And I wanted to get some groundwork and, and try to get a track record. Well, went to a few places, went to Bellevue Bookstore. I went to uh, Promised Land Bookstore in Paris, Tennessee. Uh, went to several Christian bookstores, a Living Waters Bookstore in Millington, Tennessee. Went to several bookstores, and I have a cross that actually holds these books. Uh, the cross has seven nails on it, and on each nail, two books will hang. So we put up these displays. It was phenomenal. People came in. There were people that came in. One lady came in in Bellevue's bookstore, and there were six books left on the cross, and she bought all six of them. Oh. And she sent them to her friends in California. So she... You know, she really thought that was great. You know, I was just thinking, when you're trying to write a story, especially when you've got three, as you mentioned, ordinary characters, but trying to give them all personality, mm -hmm. how did you do that? It's so interesting that you asked me that. We didn't start out talking about this, but uh, the book originally was about three men uh, that go back in time. Uh, I came to find out from a dear friend of mine, a, a, a doctor buddy, Jody Clemens, uh, we were talking about the three characters, uh, Dr. Bill Stewart and Professor Leonardo Van Eaton and Reverend Paul Ryan. And he looked at me one night and he said, you know, all three of these guys are you, man. Every one of these guys are you in different parts of your life. You know, there's an agnostic, there's a pastor, and there's a, there's a Christian that uh, he doesn't really know what to do because he's so new in the faith. He was right. All of those people were. Well, that's how we went with the book, and we had three men that went back in time. Well, I go and I meet with uh, Joan. This was the very first publisher I, I met with, went to Nashville and met with her and with Carrie Johnson with APG Distributors. I found out that you have to have a distributor if you're going to do anything with a book. Well, anyway, I brought the book to this first meeting, and they were sold right then. They wanted it and uh, wanted to go with it. So, But there was one stipulation. I had to change one of the main characters. One character had to be a woman. Ah. So uh, I had to take a month and think about it and pray about it. And uh, so I did end up rewriting the book. And, was that difficult? Yeah. Not that you have anything against women. <laughs> but, you know, I know as an artist or as one is creating a story and you've got these set figures and people in your mind, right. it must have been difficult for well, you to change it. Well, it was. It. it was difficult because those characters for the past 13 years and now uh, Dr. Bill Stewart became Dr. Elizabeth Stewart. And it changed the dynamic of the book. There were uh, things, you know, when they went back in time, uh, you know, there were sleeping arrangements. They were there at night. How did I get past that? 
Well, there's just really some great, uh, some great things in the book that hit on that. We were able to cover everything quite well. And quite frankly, uh, Joan with uh, Sheaf House, she said, she said, Don, women really read a lot more than men do in, in the book world. And uh, she said, we've got to have a, a main character be a woman in this. So I said, okay. So uh, we ended up negotiating and, and, uh, and now it's uh, two men and a woman uh, back in time. So uh, it, it works. It really does work. Talk about how important it was for your family during these past 14 years to be there through the process of this and the encouragement they brought you. I know your wife had to be a great resource of comfort and encouragement to you. Well, right. Of course, my children are all grown and, and don't live at home, so it's me, me and my wife. And I spent a lot of time at home, many, many hours at home, and uh, working on the book and, and sacrificing a lot of time, sacrificing our time. And uh, it wasn't always pleasant. I'm not going to say that it was. But uh, uh, overall, my wife was very gracious. She did say to me one time something that, was, uh, that I'll never forget. She said, you're a better man when you write. And she said, and I love it when you write. Well, wow. You know, and hey, you know, what can I say? You know? Is writing something that just pretty much came natural for you? Um, not really. It, it didn't come as natural as I wanted it to, but it was something that it just became a process. I took some writing courses at Memphis State when it was Memphis State, and, and one of the things that my writing teacher told me, she said, any book that is similar to what you like and what you want your book to read like, she said, read everything you can, read everything. So I've read a lot of Peretti, read a lot of uh, Decker, because that's what I like. By doing that, the more that you read, the more you can, you'll tend to emulate other people and all, other authors. You know, we're living in such an electronic age today. Are people still reading like they used to? I mean, you know, 14 years ago, a lot has changed in 14 years. Even technology has changed, and even the way people are reading books. You know, they've got these new devices now you can hold in your hand, and it's got all kinds of books in there. What do you think about those changes? Well, we are. Uh, the book will be an e-book. Uh, eventually, uh, that's something that can be done very easy. Um, it it uh, can actually be done in, in a couple of days. Uh, so it's something that we can do. But overall, uh, I'm finding the vast majority of people, uh, especially women, when they talk about reading books, they want to hold it in their hands. Even my wife herself said, I just want to hold it in my hands. I want to feel the pages between my fingers. She says that's what it's all about. She said in a Kindle or, or another e-book, I just can't do that. Uh, there is something special about it. There's nothing like having a quality book on your library shelf at home, you know, that uh, you can share with family and friends. And Now, places the books available, Don, if folks are not able to come again to the Family Christian Bookstore, which we know there's a display there. You mentioned Bellevue Baptist Church. Other places the book is available? Uh, well, right now, uh, if you could go online to Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com, ChristianBooks.com. Uh, all three of those uh, websites have it. As far as uh, the local bookstores, working on Barnes & Nobles, but it's probably still going to be another week or so before we can tangibly get them in Barnes & Nobles. You can go in and order it there. The book's not in the store yet, but hopefully within the next week or so, we'll uh, be able to you know, get them here local. And I believe there's a website, too, for the book. So right. folks can go give us that address. Yeah, that's questforthenailprints.com. That is the website that will show the book. It'll give a little bit of background to uh, to me and to the book, uh, what's going on, some of the people that have endorsed it. Mr. Joe Bonsell, uh, the uh, tenor singer for the Oak Ridge Boys, he has endorsed the book, highly recommended it, and uh, he's just a great guy, and uh, he absolutely loved the book. Howie Klossner, who wrote the Grace Card that is obviously out in Memphis right now, uh, the movie, and Howie has endorsed it. Howie uh, wrote The Grace Card. He also uh, wrote the movie uh, Space Cowboys. With Clint so, Eastwood. Yeah, yeah, with Clint Eastwood. He sure did. And uh, those two have endorsed it. We have uh, many other people that are reading the book right now. Actually, Paul Young, William Paul Young, who wrote The Shack, uh, has agreed to read it. He is reading it now. Actually, uh, Robert Powell. Robert was the man that played Jesus in Jesus of Nazareth in the 19th 1978 version, Franco Zeffirelli's Jesus of Nazareth, and he is 67 years old now is playing he really? Jesus. So wow. it's very interesting to see 
uh, Mr. Powell uh, at this age and My, think about you know him playing I, Jesus. I think that movie has been translated into more languages and yeah. shown more times to present the gospel around the world than any other movie. And I spoke to him through his publicist, and he said he lives in England, and he said he would be glad to read the book, and hopefully if he likes it, he'll endorse it. So well, I'm hoping he will.